excited. Will you stay with us? Let's celebrate the Lord.
We are so glad you're here. Welcome. Wonderful. And sometimes people say, gee, what are we going to do in heaven? Well, I think we got an idea here, right? Fellowship with one another around the name of Jesus. Fantastic. Well, we're very glad you're here this morning, and I'm shouting, and I might not. Sorry about that. Cleaning out those ears this morning, right? Back to school, boys. Thank you, yes, Jim. All right. Well, a meteorologist says we are into fall, so I hope you're starting to think about you know what season coming up after that. Get those snow shovels sharpened. I don't usually sharpen mine, but I guess you're supposed to. Anyway, we're glad you're here, and uh, if you do not have a church home, we'd love for you to make uh, faith your church home. Um, we're small but very friendly, and uh, we teach the Word of God um, and love Jesus here. So, uh, Just looking at the announcements, uh, Sean will be speaking us. Uh, to us this morning. Uh, just upcoming Grief Share uh, begins uh, the 14th on a uh, Thursday evening from 6.30 to 8. And um, something that you or someone you know might, might need to consider. Uh, the Harmony Women's Care Annual Dinner Fundraising Banquet is uh, the 26th up in uh, Warwick. And uh, the Women's Study, guys, we better get on, on track here. Um, the women's study starts Thursday night the 12th, and uh, they'll be studying Tuesday night the 12th. Thank you. <laughs> Just like school, the kids are always correcting they start me. Sometimes. All right, they start thir Tuesday night the 12th at 6.30 p.m., and they're going to be studying uh, Ruth, and we have a little short video clip uh, on that. We all know that life can be so hard, and as a result, there are so many who live through tremendous loss and tragedy. We can even get to the point where we wonder, is there any hope left at all? This is why I love the book of Ruth, because even though it starts with tremendous loss, we see that God's hand never leaves his people. Hey, my name is Kelly Minter, and I am thrilled to bring you Ruth, Loss, Love, and Legacy. Over the next seven sessions together, we are going to see God's tremendous heart for the vulnerable, the lost, and the brokenhearted. We're going to see his redemptive hand take brokenness into abundance. And we're going to see how we can leave divine legacy. I cannot wait to take this journey together with you. All right. Very good. And uh, if you are planning on attending and haven't uh, talked to Mary Lee and back or Ellen, don't see Ellen, she's around, uh, and need a book, uh, please make sure you see them today and let them know. Bring a friend as well. Um, looks like a great study. Um, I did uh, find out yesterday uh, that uh, Peter Richards, who has uh, had been a member here for quite a few years, um, many of us know, uh, did pass into the Lord's hands um, on uh, August 26th. And uh, the funeral, I understand, was yesterday. And we just want to make sure we're praying for Kathy uh, during her time of, uh, of loss and mourning. Peter. Would you stand with me for opening prayer, please? Lord, we're thankful so much that uh, we have an opportunity this morning to come and hear from you. And we're reminded just in this very brief video that you're a God who takes people from brokenness to abundance. And you do it by grace, a free gift. And God, this morning we're amazed and humbled that you take us and move us through life into a closer relationship and eventually an eternal relationship with you. God, I thank you for each one here. You know our hearts. You know the things that make us hurt and make us mad, the things that uh, thrill our hearts and everything in between. 
And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to each one of us through Sean this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be together as Christians in a free nation in, in the midst of a world that's, that's really full of chaos. But God, we know that you still sit on the heavenly throne and we can trust you. I pray this morning, God, that um, in, in every way, Sean will have freedom to speak uh, your word to us and that we'll respond as we should. God bless those who uh, aren't here for various reasons. I pray especially for Kathy Richards at this time and family and friends uh, during this time of loss. Lord, may you in a special way uh, make your presence and your peace known to her. Uh, we continue in worship towards you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Celebrate the Lord. Let's worship Him. I search the world. Here we go. I search the world. But He couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures and faith are never enough. You know what? We come in these four walls and we worship him. You can sing praises unto his name. Amen. So just let it let it rip, as they say. Let's enjoy the Lord, shall we? Here we go. 
<clears throat> that's funny. A classic Revelation song.
those of you that are coming here possibly for the very first time. Just like to let you know that there's three men that lead us on Sunday morning. They're the ones that share the time with us. There's time that they shared with the board in preparation for the message that they bring each Sunday morning. And for each one of you, to them, I say thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> great to see everyone. Thanks for friends and family coming and worshiping with us. Belinda's family, that's great. And Fred's family, Joanne's family, it's great. I hear your voices and we're singing praises. It's just so freeing to me. I hope it is to you. Amen. You know, there's so much difficulty during the week of, of surviving sometimes in this world. You know, you, you get through so many battles and you're exhausted. You know, so many obligations, whether it, it, it's children or work or family, finances, you're worried about health, you're worried about your money. But know always that God is in control. And although he gives us free will to make our own choices, he loves us enough to keep us in the palm of his hand. He loves enough, us enough to call us and reach out to us as we reach out to him. And really, quite frankly, scripture is very clear. None of us could have the power to save ourselves, amen? It's only by the prompting of God that we have an opportunity to have the shackles and chains fall off and know who Jesus Christ really is. So I'm going to pray once again before we get into the message. We're going to be talking today about the centurion, who is uh, a Roman. And um, I hope the Lord uh, gives you a great word today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Roman centurion who had such great faith, Lord. Thank you for Jesus Christ and his interactions with anyone. It's a reminder to each of us that he loves everyone and values everyone and desires that we would turn to him, not only for salvation, but in our time of need, in our time of celebration, in our time of pain, in our time of loneliness, in our time of anxiety and fear. Just to remind us that we are not alone and he loves us the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So we commit this service to you, Lord. We lift it up to you. Thank you for all the hearts and souls that are here. We pray for those who couldn't come, who might hear it online. Instill in us, Lord, the desire to share the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, welcome back, friends and family. We are continuing on in our uh, encounters with Jesus, as I call it. Lee calls it conversations with Christ. <laughs> and, uh, but they're both the same thing, really, when you think about it. <clears throat> encounters with Jesus and conversations with Christ. So we've been looking at individuals who have had interactions with Jesus, primarily in the, in, um, the Gospels. But we did talk about Paul, uh, uh, Saul, and who converted and was changed into Paul. In his encounter with Jesus Christ. Today we're going to talk about the centurion, the Roman centurion. And uh, here's a, a, a little memory verse that uh, you could embrace if you'd like. It's in Luke 7, 9, and you also find it in the book of Matthew chapter 8. But it says this, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned to the crowd that followed him and said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Not in, even in Israel have I found such faith. In this scripture verse, he's talking about the centurion's faith. The Roman centurion who was a Gentile, who was not a Jew. And scripture is very clear, and we don't have to go through the record in the scriptures, that the gospel was preached to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And most everyone in here is a Gentile, right? Except for Fred. And anyone else that might be Jewish that hasn't told me. So thank you, Fred, for representing all the Jews of the world. And thank you, everyone here, for representing the rest of the Gentiles. Amen. So anyway, so that's where we are. So let's get into this a little bit, and, and we're going to get into his word. It won't be too long today, because I don't want to be too long on a beautiful, sunny day. But who is the centurion? 
Oh yeah, you can go back up. This is the name of the, the title of the message for anyone that scratches notes. Living with such great faith. And it's talking about us too. Not just about the centurion. Okay, let's let's jump into this. Who is the centurion? He could look like this guy. At least I found this guy on the internet as a reenactor of a centurion. Or it could be this guy right here. Maybe some of you have seen the movie Risen. And the Risen was about a Roman centurion. And it was fairly fictional, but it was very interesting because it showed the centurion's desire to find out who this Jesus was. And it was after the resurrection. So it's much different than the story we're talking about today. So if you want to know a little bit more about the Roman centurion, here's a, a description. He was a Gentile. Doubtless he had a pagan upbringing. He was Roman, stationed in Palestine to subject the Jews to the emperor's rule. He was a man of war. He achieved the rank of centurion by distinguishing himself above others in the brutal Roman art, uh, martial arts. So the Roman centurion wasn't necessarily your friendly guy. He wasn't going to be walking down the street and, and helping old ladies off the ground, really. He commanded uh, an army of over 100, and they engaged in brutal war, and they engaged in making sure that the public adhered to the law. So let's talk about the Romans and the Jews of the time. The Romans were occupying what we call Palestine, but it's Israel. And in Jerusalem in particular, the Romans were occupying it present day. So the, the Jewish leaders were not really friendly with a Roman centurion. And there were multiple Roman centurions, it wasn't just one. And this particular one finds his way and is, is in interacting with Jesus. Now, some people think this Roman centurion might have been Cornelius, and Cornelius comes up and pops up in the book of Acts, and Cornelius is a, is a believer. Could be. But I don't know that that's necessarily important for us, for us to definitively decide. What's more important is that this centurion had been exposed to who Jesus Christ was. And he wanted to pursue him. It was not his common faith. The Romans and Greeks of the times had multiple gods, right? The Jews had one God. The God of the Bible. But this centurion was on a path to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. There's a little background on our, our friend, the Roman centurion. So turn with me, if you will, to Matthew 8, 5 through 13. When he, Jesus, had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. That may sound familiar to my Catholic friends. For I am, I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Now we all know, or most of us should know, there's four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, there's another account of this in the book of Luke. And I want us to just scratch on that a little bit, if we would. So turn with me, if you would, be so kind, to Luke 7, verses 1 through 10. After he had entered, after he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now we're talking about Jesus again. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pled with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him. This is the Jews saying it. For he has loved our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I do not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. 
For I too am a man set under authority with the soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. Turned to the crowd that followed him and said, I tell you, even in Israel have I found, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. So there's a few differences, and, and many of you um, deep thinkers and intellectual people probably don't like anything that would be inconsistent. But there is an explanation when you read the record. And when I say the record, I mean the Bible. There's a congruency and a harmony of the Gospels. But that doesn't always mean that the account is going to be identical. But there's an explanation for it. So I just want to point out a few things before we get underway. Matthew's account is in Matthew 8, and Luke's account is in Luke 7. In Matthew's account, the centurion asked Jesus to heal a servant who is tormented, right, and, and sick and dying. But in the Luke's account, he sends, he sends the Jewish elders to speak to Jesus and ask his servant to be saved. Matthew makes no mention of that. Jesus promised to heal him. In the other account, Jesus says he's going to go and heal him. And then finally, Centurion sends friends to speak with Jesus in, in uh, Luke 7. And then Jesus, and, and then we have the same account that I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. I had that so memorized with 25 years in the Catholic Church. An uncle who is a Monsignor. It is still said to these days. But it's it's relevant to what we're talking about here. So and Jesus marvels at his faith. So look at this next note, and this is what I want you, and then finally these last two differences. Obviously the servants return and find he's healed, and, and Jesus commands the servants healed. So what's the difference? Is, is the, the Bible, it should have all be thrown out because now we have a discrepancy? No, no, not at all. First of all, let's talk about a couple of different things here. First of all, Matthew is written primarily to a Jewish audience. That's interesting, right? So, Matthew's not lying, but culturally, these two accounts are the same. Very much the centurion could have went in person, but also, if people are speaking on behalf of the centurion, the centurion would have sent himself. It's the same thing. Also, Luke is considered to have been a, a Greek physician. He's a Gentile. Isn't that fantastic and fascinating that a Gentile got chosen to write one of the Gospels? Many of you may not have known that. And his focus was on the Gentile audience. Why does that matter to us today? Well, let me say this much to you. The Jewish leaders of the day would not have received very well that they thought this centurion was such a great guy and, 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 said, and, and vouched for him. It's unlikely that they would have heard what Jesus was saying. They would have struggled with that. However, the Gentiles needed to hear that the Jews were worthy and the chosen people first. And the Gentiles got salvation through the God of the Bible who chose the Jews as the people. See, there was this difficulty, and there is today, culturally. Someone's different than you. We decide to label who may be worthy of the gospel. We decide to be labeled who may be worthy of salvation. We're out there sharing who we are. Truth be told, no one's worthy. No one's worthy to have an interaction with Jesus Christ. But he loves us, all of us. And then he will communicate to us that deep love he has for us. The Jews of the day needed to hear that the Gentiles were going to get salvation. That's why when you read Matthew, it talks about the Gentiles getting salvation from the far as the east into the west, right? That's the whole world. The gospel was not just for the Jews. Now remember, the Jews were waiting for a savior, right? Their homeland was controlled by other countries. They wanted to be free. But Jesus wasn't bringing earthly freedom. Just like <clears throat> today, we could be in prison and be more freer than everyone here through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen? Isn't that true? You can have a relationship with God and be so locked up in your own troubles that you don't feel free. 
Yet the person convicted of a crime that is more guiltier than all of us can fellowship and worship Jesus Christ in prison and be free. That's the freedom that God promises us. But that's where the gospel comes in, right? We have to recognize who we are without Jesus Christ. We are all unworthy and fall short of the glory of God. We all have sin. And anyone that doesn't think they have sin is lying and sinning, right? And we have this measure in our life that we decide to graft as to what God decides is, is reasonable for us to get to heaven. I do believe most believe, people believe in heaven and, and hell. They may not admit it, but I do believe they believe it. And most people will say, I'm good enough to get into heaven. I do this, I do that. That person does this, that person does that. How arbitrary. Doesn't sound like a loving God to me. Well, you might get into heaven. Or you might not get into heaven. Faith. Jesus shared openly that the centurion had greater faith than anything he had seen in Israel up to that point. For the Jews of the day, that would have been blinding. But think about it. I am not worthy to receive you. Lord, only say your word, God, and I will be healed. Friends, that is the gospel. Think of it this way. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I fall short. And I understand that you are perfect in perfection. And I know now and I understand that Jesus Christ died at the cross for my sin. And I confess I'm a sinner. I confess that I fall short. I understand now that by believing in what Jesus did at the cross and inviting him into my life, I will have salvation. I will be saved. That is the gospel. God, I'm not worthy to be in your kingdom. But you can heal me. And anyone struggling with something in life, seeking healing, the greatest healing you can have is spiritual healing. We are a broken people. This world is broken. And you can see it getting worse day by day. It is broken on the internet and social media. It is broken in our school systems. It is broken in the corporations. It is clearly broken in our government and here we are struggling with all this brokenness around us and trying to say, God, why? We're asking the wrong question. If God took away our free will, what would love be reduced to? Think about that. Hear that again. If God took away your capacity to love freely, what is the value of love? Everyone here has to make a decision in their life. Am I going to decide Jesus is who he says he is and allow him to be my savior? Give up my life and allow him to live through me. That's a choice we all get to make. Everyone. And you're all here, which is exciting. So obviously you all have an interest. And we believe in God and his power of his Holy Spirit. And my words are only words, but God is still God. So let's talk about faith, shall we? I probably skipped ahead seven slides, but that's okay, Sharon. What is faith? The centurion was faithful. Everyone like that? He was full of faith. He was faithful. He was full of faith. His faith was full. And I know a lot of you here are struggling. I struggle. On a daily basis, I struggle. I don't understand a lot of things, and I don't want certain things to happen, and I don't like my flesh and my sinful nature. But God is faithful. The centurion is an example of being full of faith. Being full of faith. Well, we have a definition, and if you turn to Hebrews 11 and 1, and here's a, here's a, a little hook for you. We're coming back up to Hebrews, right, Lee? Amen. And that's coming up soon, isn't it? Very soon. 
But this is what Hebrews tells us about in our faith chapter. Chapter 11, faith. This is a good chapter for everyone to read. It's about our faith warriors in the Bible, Old Testament. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith says, you know what? I can't see it. Faith says, you know what? I know God loves me. Faith says, I'm going to trust him. Faith says, I want this outcome, Lord, and I'm praying for it. But even if that outcome doesn't happen, I'm going to trust you. Faith says, I'm going to believe that God loves me, even when bad things happen to me. You know, the biggest question I get often from people who have deep thoughts is, why does God allow so much suffering? Why does God allow suffering? And, the, and, and truly, no one has a great answer. But I will say this. As believers of God of the Bible, we have the greatest answer of all. This is not the end. This is only the beginning. Eternity is a long time. So even if you suffer, this whole entire life you're on earth, but God has given you salvation through the power of Jesus Christ. That is greater than anything you can receive on this earth. That is true. There's no other religion that can say that. You can go search them. There's a lot of works out there. Working your way to heaven. Working your way to reincarnation into something better. But the God of the Bible says, I love you. And I need you to trust me. Because my will is greater than anything you have ever seen. My plan is greater than anything you could envision. Your life is for my glory when you get saved. That's why sometimes things are working in it. And something comes out of it that you don't get to see. Not in this life, but maybe in the next for sure. That's faith. And here's a, here's a reminder when you think about, am I all alone? Am I all alone in producing this faith I need? And the answer is absolutely not. Your component of faith is trusting in God. Your component of faith is spending time with God through your turmoil. And hopefully through your celebrations, right? Now Peter was a, a faithful servant here. You heard of him earlier. I believe he was 85 years old around there. Great guy, Kathy Richards. You might remember her. She did a lot of our puppets. She did the puppet thing. They loved the Lord, and now he gets his reward. Think about that. Death brings a reward of heaven, but more importantly, of God and into his presence. We don't think about it that often that enough. And other religions in the other religions in the earth don't think about it that way. Death is, is, is mourning and sorrowful in the end. I have atheist friends and, you know, they're grabbing on to whatever it is on this earth. Humanism is at an all-time high right now. Our young people and old people are, are, are turning away from the God of the Bible and not even consider them. And you know what? All that stuff comes up empty. It's temporary. It passes away. All things are going to pass away. There are no trailers to heaven or hell. It's you. It's your soul. That's it. Nothing else. That's why it's time. Time to consider. Time to consider where's my eternity. Time to consider this man Jesus of the Bible. Not only that, if you have him, it's time to live a gratitude life, a thankful life. A life, a servant's heart life. And I know we're not going to do it every day, but enough of this woe is me. God's called you out of darkness and into his light to have fellowship with him during this life. Enjoy it. Stop worrying so much. Man, this we're at an all-time high of anxiety. And I know because I probably have some too. <laughs> this message is for me too. Hebrews 12, 1b, 
because I cut out the first part. Not because I'm taking it out of context for all you theologians. But I don't want you to focus on that part. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. It is there in blue. I put it in blue because it was a nice color. I was like, red's out. Can't use red. Yellow looked too much like a highlighter. I was like, can't use red. The yellow. So it's blue. Founder and perfecter of our faith. Friends, Jesus went to the cross and endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of, of God. Victory over death. And there it is. Your faith is founded by Jesus Christ and perfected by Jesus Christ. We're almost done, Benji. <laughs> Second Timothy 2 through 13 just reminds us this. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from many in the presence of many witnesses entrusted to faithful men who will be able to teach us, teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. That'd be Jesus. And an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And this is what I often quote. If we have remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preaching in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as criminal. This is the Apostle Paul. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that's us, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we have endured, we also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Your God is faithful. Even when your faith dries up, even when you are at your end, God is still there saying, don't give up. Because I'm here. And for all you hard workers, this is a great reminder. And Billy Graham said this about faithfulness. God will not reward fruitfulness. He rewards faithfulness. I love that. Sometimes we measure outcome, output, right? 10 people got saved. 10,000 people. I mean, Billy Graham's thousands of people got saved. Who could be millions of his messages. But you know what? Faithfulness. My faithful servant not my fruitful servant god produces the fruit doesn't he faithfulness powers fruit just trust god and this is a good illustration from jesus mark 12 41 through 44 this is a lady who comes up to the treasury has nothing and and, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny and he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contribute out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. She was faithful. She trusted God with all she had and offered it up to him. In closing, points to ponder. Find Jesus Christ and pursue by faith. And for everyone struggling, even during your troubled times, trust Jesus. Be reminded that Jesus is both the author and perfecter of your faith. You don't produce your faith alone. God powers it. And remember, God rewards you for your faithfulness, not your fruitfulness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to come before you and thank you. Thank you for the centurion who had such great faith. Thank you that Jesus Christ loves us all. His love for us is not measured by who we are or what we do. Father, anyone in here struggling right now, suffering or doubt, anger, anxiety, 
We pray that your Holy Spirit would clear that up, Lord. That you draw them unto yourself as only you can. That Jesus Christ would become real to them. And they would walk by faith. Father, we're looking forward to you doing a great work in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stay with us, will you? I think this song is about being in heaven on earth before we go to heaven. Here in your 
Sean talked about today about faith and as we know the acronym uh, faith is forsaking all I trust him and, and may we trust him now um, let's just pause for a word of prayer before we depart thank you father for the word that you've given us today thank you that we have the example of the faith of the of the centurion who didn't even require, knew that he didn't require Jesus' very presence in the house to heal his servant, but he said, but say the word and you shall be healed. Help us, Father, have that same trusting faith in, in all we do, and as it, we know in the book of Philippians, it says that you will supply all of our needs in your riches and glory in, in Christ Jesus. So, so thank you for that. May we depend on that. May we take this journey of faith that you would have us on right now. And may we go in a direction, Father, that you take us that we are not expecting. And this life in you is not boring. So take us on that journey and, and let us continue to worship you in all we do. Help us think about what Sean talked about this week and bring those passages and those stories to mind. And as we leave, may we depart in your presence and they we leave with safety until we see each other again in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen.